Good to go. Right, we're going to get <laughs> kick off now. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our Ideas Cafe, People, Place, and Perspective. Um, I'm Ellie, and I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, I'm here with the Rural Youth Project. Um, for anybody that is new to us, um, we're a Scottish-based organisation working with young people, um, and our mission is to support young people um, by to better understand, representing and encouraging young people into leadership, enterprise and activism. Um, we do this mostly through story gathering and telling and linking people and ideas. And we've been running these ideas cafes for a few years now, and it's been um, such so great to have, we've had so many different discussions with lots of different um, young people in rural areas about all things like living rurally. Um, and this one is brilliant because we're joined with our great long-term allies, great places, lakes and dales. Um, so we've partnered up, we've been looking for ways to collaborate for so long now because um, we've got so many sort of similar goals and um, yeah, values. Um, so I will hand over to Beth to introduce GPLD, which I was getting the letters the wrong way around. <laughs> Um, to hear how you guys work. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we, it stands for Great Place Lakes and Dales and uh, we do very similar. We work with, we want to empower and champion young voices in the Lakes and Dales area, um, work to retain young people in the area as they come back from uni, um, like um, encourage creative careers in the area um, and just champion young voices and yeah, creative platforms. So very similar values to you. So it's it's great to partner up finally. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and so everyone will be well aware and already has, but we're just gonna keep ourselves muted through this discussion so that we can hear the speakers really well. Um, but please feel free to interrupt. We're very interruptible and it can, it's a very informal, relaxed chat. Um, so if you have a burning question, then please do either drop it in the chat or um, just shout out. So that's absolutely fine. And if you have any questions, um, please do put them in the chat um, about either organisation or whatever it, it will be. And we'll, we'll try and answer those at the end. And we will leave space at the end for a Q&A. Um, so yeah, without so further that, ado. Yeah. Sorry. 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 <laughs> sorry. Uh, say, so we've lost one of our, our speakers today to a power cut. So Josh sadly can't make it because the whole village has gone down, which is just, um, uh, we're all quite used to this now. So we'll be flexible and adaptable. So we've got um, two of our wonderful speakers and it's going to be, yeah, just great, really great to hear the insights that they have from very, two very creative people that have set up their own initiatives. Um, and just to hear a bit more about their stories and journeys would be brilliant and probably very useful for other young people thinking of doing similar things. So I'll hand over to Beth for introductions. So yeah, we'll, we'll hand over to Jess and Rosie. They both come from very different backgrounds. Uh, if you'd like to both introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you're from, what you're about, and uh, about both your organisations. Uh, Jess, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone and thanks for joining. Um, I'm Jess and I run a festival arts, music and arts initiative called 42 Degrees. Um, we had our first ever festival this July coming um, and hopefully it's going to be an annual kind of thing with other events going on throughout the year. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from the south and I've moved to the north. Uh, I live currently in Lancaster, um, but I did a lot of work in the Lake District, um, particularly in Penrith, um, during my project and hope to do a lot more in that area through 42 degrees. So yeah, that's me. Perfect. And Rosie, you would like to, you would like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Rosie. Um, I have, oh, it's, sorry, it's so weird. It's a big version of me here. <laughs> I've got a micro bakery and a converted horse box and I'm currently based in King Craig, which is between King Easy and Avonmore. Um, yeah, it's called Reviving Food. That's probably helpful information as well. Um, it's just about working more directly with producers and making good bread like available here. And then kind of all the things that comes about from sharing bread, basically. So it's a lot of folk chatting with each other and making connections. So that's what I'm pretty passionate about. 
Super. So can I hear a bit about um, why you care about what you do, Rosie? We'll start with you and then I'll, go, I'll jump to Jess. So what is it that makes you care about what you do with your bakery? Why does it matter to the world? And um, what led you to it? <laughs> so, yeah, so what led me to it was, it's about trying to reduce our impact in the environment. So like I was, I was an outdoor instructor originally and it was about trying to talk about environmental change like through sport and and then led to gardening and then cooking with the stuff I was growing uh, and then basically I kind of got obsessed with bread through that and then realized it's about having developing more local grain economies and doing stuff on a more like small scale so that's why I'm working with Scotland the bread and they're growing grains in Fife and they've got a wee mill there I mill some stuff here I also get flour from Mungles Wells in East Lothian and I get salt from Sky, and it's just about trying to work more directly with producers and yeah, share those stories as well. But, and then, like I say, make bread, good bread for folk here. So it's kind of, yeah, just overall trying to reduce our impact on the environment through kind of doing things a bit more small scale or on a human scale. That's a nicer way of putting things. Does that answer that part? answers it brilliantly yes definitely um and so so for you that's what yeah that's what makes you care about bread <laughs> well oh no okay. well i can really talk about the reason i actually really love bread is because it's flour water salt and it's like three things that change they're so dynamic and they're different daily with the weather so the bread was actually not so great on saturday morning there because the way that things were with the weather on friday and there's i should have uh, I underestimated how cold it was going to be and then because of the wind there was this draft coming through the roof of the kitchen so everything was just a bit kind of tighter and denser but you know I should have taken that into consideration but these are just three ingredients and time and how they evolve and yeah so just kind of getting interested in that and that's why it, and then I don't know I, it's just an obsession really <laughs> It's amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm fully obsessed, but I definitely don't. It's very it's a very variable experience, isn't it? it really is like you have to just kind of go with what <laughs> what the weather says, what the flower says. It's really interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rosie. So over to you, Jess. Um, yeah. Would you tell us like what what has like driven you to um, set up 42 degrees? Why did you care about it? Why do you think it's so important? And um, yeah, what's a bit, a bit about your journey to getting there? I was thinking about this today um, and I think a, a few things kind of played a part in me setting up 42 degrees. Um, I think I've always wanted to have music and the arts as a big part of my life and I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor um, during during the day <laughs> and I really didn't want that part of my I didn't want that to be my whole life and um, I get a lot of happiness and pleasure from playing with other musicians and dancing with other people and meeting new people that share that same love um, and at uni I had I was spoiled I, you, I don't know my uni had so many different kind of clubs going on different bands to play in different gigs to go to and I was terrified that I wouldn't have that um, when I left uni and I think that was one big thing for me uh, so that was my kind of motive for myself um, it was something that I, I get a lot of pleasure from that I wanted to continue in my life um, and then I guess I think a catalyst was the fact I was moving to a, a new place um, and somewhere so beautiful um, like so close to the Lake District and I thought this would be an amazing place to kind of run an event where people come together kind of switch off from everything else around them in their life and just kind of embrace um, some incredible music and art um, so I think that was a real catalyst for me and um, I'm really passionate to kind of support up-and-coming musicians and artists I think I didn't really want to mention Covid very much but it was also a reason that got me thinking about setting up a smaller um, local, more local based initiative where we celebrate up and coming artists. Um, Cause I've got a lot of musicians as friends and 
it was really quite striking how much of an impact it had on them and I really would like to kind of develop that kind of um, area of like festivals where it's more smaller and more community based um, and celebrates people that potentially might not get so much of a limelight. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the three factors that played a part in me putting together 42 degrees. Um, yeah. I can't believe that you're doing that on the side of being a doctor. <laughs> that's amazing. Neither. <laughs> I think a lot of my uh, friends think I'm a bit crazy, but um, no, it's a real, it's a real passion, and it's something I love to do. Um, it was very difficult last year, I think, as the first year because there's so many unknowns. Um, but I, I found the whole experience so interesting and so exciting, and yeah, it's an amazing thing to have in my life that I can kind of. It's like my side project, I guess, but will hopefully one day be much more of a bigger part of my life. Um, yeah. That's the hope anyway. That sounds wicked. Um, and this year was the second year? So, no, this, I keep, I keep talking in 42 degree years. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one just gone. Yeah. <laughs> it's my life <laughs> now. Um, so the festival, the first year was this year in July. Um, so we've just done it a few months ago. Um, but it was a whole year, obviously, in a bit before of leading up to it and um, planning. Uh, so the next festival, the second festival will be next year. But we're already starting working on that. So Amazing. Oh, thanks so much, Jess. So um, following on from that, um, so what does community mean to you? So this could be your festival community, even I know you've moved up, uh, up north from down south. Do you find that it's more connected, less connected? Um, yeah, and just what what does working as a community mean to you? Um, start, with Jeff, start with Jess, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I found this, I was thinking for quite a while, because it's quite an open-ended question. I guess there are so many ways you can answer it. Um, and I obviously did the, the Google search of what Google thinks community means. And um, they Google talks about, like, the location that you're based in and being shared by a location and I think something I really learned from my experience doing 42 degrees is for me community is a group of people that respect each other and celebrate each other's values um, and grow and develop through shared experiences um, but I don't think that needs to be in the same location um, I think the fact we're here today on a Zoom panel discussion is kind of an amazing example of that. Um, it's a group of people that really share similar values and uh, celebrate that. Um, and to me, that's what a community is. And yeah, 42, this year, 42 was an amazing example of that where musicians, artists came together, people who came that love music and art came together and it was a really kind of um, welcoming uh, few days. Yeah, a lot of the time community can be people you've never met before and you come together with a common value common goal and that's it it's about to fly. Um, so yeah Rosie what does um, community mean to you I know uh, within your local area obviously working with all the different flour and salt and uh, yeah how do you find community to you? I think there's lots of different types of community like so I, I think it's about sharing and it's about linking up folk and so there's the community of the folk that come and get bread so there's like they meet each other and there's loads of different stories of stuff happening like that through because it basically is it's to be a community bakery really so like during the lockdown here it was in the driveway and folk would come by and they'd straight up just be like, I'm actually looking for friends. I've just moved here, I'm looking for friends. And I was just like, well, we'll just wait 10 minutes. Someone else might turn up, you know? And then um, also there'd be like kids, their first trip away from their parents was kind of like to come over here and get some cinnamon buns and stuff like, or um, yeah, folk getting jobs and stuff too. There's just, people come and say what they're needing. And so it kind of becomes a place of linking stuff and sharing. And that's like the kind of immediate 
I don't know, call it like the bread community, I guess. But then I've got another layer of kind of bread community, which is the other bakers. So the other bakers that kind of give a crap about where stuff's coming from. And um, there's quite a few of us actually in Scotland, r- roughly about the same age as well. So that's really good. And we try and meet up and work out how we can make a change to the system. So um, yeah, I, I organised an event a couple of years ago called Common Grains, and that was just to get folk that were interested in developing local grain economy in Scotland to get together. So the idea was to get us in like one shed. So um, yeah, and work out what needed to change and what we could work on doing. So that was the November, November 2019. Um, so that's like another group and that involves farmers and millers as well um, and brewers and bakers and researchers. And then there's kind of the wider community of like, Kim down at Small Food Bakery and like kind of bigger or been at it longer and same in Europe as well like I went and visited and worked with loads of different bakers in the Netherlands and Belgium and so that's like a I don't know it's a wider support network kind of community but yeah so that's like what Jess was saying I think it's to do with it's not there's a community that's defined by being located in King Craig or kind of this area but then also the ones that's just got a similar way of thinking or trying to work on the same project so and it's really yeah. nice that they all overlap as well because there's also other communities around here too like skiing community and the biking community and i just see it's a whole Amazing. bunch of different circles that all link up with each other and yeah it's really nice yeah. so when there's overlap then yeah that's even better oh, thank you for sharing that that's- um I just wanted to ask you both how do you think rural areas could be if we're talking about the place-based communities because um both of you kind of yeah raised that actually there's two there's kind of almost this supportive background of people but they don't have to be actually on the ground with you um but if we're talking on the ground and because of a lot of our work for both of our organizations is about how do we um how do we ensure that young people can thrive living in their rural communities? Um, if we were thinking about the place-based communities, how do you guys think from what you've learned and your experiences, how we could be better connected? Um, maybe Jess, over to you. Yeah, um, I think, so I was just thinking about how I kind of went about the running of the festival in the Lake District, which um, actually is, is quite well connected. But something that I really was experienced from that was we worked with an organization um, called Arts Emergency. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they um, kind of, they run mentoring schemes for um, young younger adults who are keen to get into the arts, but have difficulty accessing the arts for whatever reason. Um, And we gave uh, a few free tickets um, to that community um, to kind of be able to come to the festival. And one thing I hadn't thought of, and maybe that's my ignorance, was the actual accessibility of getting to the festival. Because yes, it's easy to get on the motorway if you have a car, but if you don't have a car, that's very difficult. And things like that, that I hadn't actually thought about. And I guess in terms of how we can make it more accessible for rural communities, um, something we're really looking at doing this year is making sure there's transport from those areas. Um, So I think that's one way of making it more accessible in terms of actually just getting to the place. Um, In terms of finding out more about initiatives like this, um, I think social media is really good for that. I think having Instagram, as much as sometimes it can have negative impact on people's mental well-being, I think it can also be a really great platform to make people aware of things that are going on. And you only have to kind of follow a few people and then you get sucked into other initiatives that are similar. Um, So I think that's been a really good bridge of making things more accessible. I think in terms of... um, living in a rural place. I don't think I'm the best person to ask. I think maybe Rosie would be better at that. Um, I don't wanna say anything that, yeah, I think from my experience, I've never lived so rural that I've not been able to access things quite easily. Um, But they're the things that I've experienced from 42 degrees. 
Mm, I think that raises a really important point as well, Jess, because it, it just shed light on transport again being such a barrier, which is what we repeatedly find in our research for the Royal Youth Project. It's such a major, it's such a major issue. And, and I think what you're saying is you you provide an event which brings community together and actually it's like always being having that awareness of accessibility and yeah the diff different people's experience and how you can engage with that um it's so vital to think from on so many different levels isn't it and um in order to make those things possible those connections possible thanks jess yeah over to you rosie so what would you say are really important factors to kind of making on the ground communities like helping them connect better <laughs> um i was kind of thinking about what jess was saying there to do with like the transport part i guess what uh, part of why i'm doing it where i am is in response to that because from here there used to be a wee shop here now there's a cafe and there's a pub um and to go and get groceries you need to travel six miles and there's buses but they're kind of maybe one every two hours or something um so the fact was about having something in the village here that was accessible um but yeah so yeah obviously the transport but then i'm living in a place where there is people that could walk here whereas where i used to live was even more remote the kind of there wasn't like a hub bit like this so um yeah i don't know what sort of, sorry could you ask a question again like, kind of well really it was um i think what i yeah i like what you're saying really i think it's the hub thing that keeps coming back up as well but really it's what really do we think that rural communities could need in order to help um them connect in more be more connected um yeah, yeah. Okay. like kind of more community spaces so basically what i've done now is years ago I had this idea about kind of community kitchens and stuff because it's like if you're in rented accommodation it's sometimes or not it's just not possible maybe to start a business because it's in your rent like I've been in places before where you couldn't run a business from where you were so it's like there needs to be places where you can actually yeah do that so I'm now moved over to the community hall and there's a kitchen in there and so it's like these those kind of facilities that exist if we could use them in a way that is creating a hub for the community I think so actually having the space and facilities for stuff um and then and that's within because i know there's a lot of folks that live kind of more isolated houses round about but it's, if there is certain kind of more centralized hubs within yeah a bit bigger areas that kind of yeah that's wicked thanks so much over to you beth well yeah it was just um are there any other challenges you faced at uh, first? Sorry. Um, so even connecting with other young people, do you find that a challenge? Um, or do you find social media helps a lot more? Um, I know with Jess as well, especially being a new festival, do you find did you find it hard to start selling tickets, uh, connecting with young people? Because uh, a lot of the time in communities, the young people tend to hide away and do their own thing. Um, so yeah, if there's any other challenges that you faced, um, just specific to young people. Uh, Jess, would you, yeah, let's start with Jess. Yeah, um, there were definitely uh, challenges, I think, uh, reaching out to, I think because I was new to the area, uh, I found that a real challenge because I was trying to set run an event that was based mainly locally <laughs> and I didn't have many contacts locally um so that was a real challenge and um it's still a challenge and I think for me I was very very fortunate that I contacted a few people I think Great Place Lakes and Dales was one of them or I don't know if you contacted me I can't remember but <laughs> somehow I fell across Great Place Lakes and Dales for example and they're really supportive and then they gave me some contacts for other people that would be really great to contact and that was amazing um I actually think then selling the tickets was <laughs> kind of a hard hard there was loads of great supportive organizations that were really happy to like publicize about us and do call outs for artists but I think it's always really difficult when it's your 
first year because you have nothing to prove for yourself apart from a lot of energy and passion and yeah hope that people have some faith in you um so that was really hard um and I think the kind of barriers were mainly trying to reach out to young audiences because you're completely right it is really hard to get those young people unless one person in that I don't want I don't want to generalize but I found a lot of the time like when I'd go around at, at my work and just kind of talk to young people and be like this is what I'm running would you be interested that they'd, they'd be really excited for about two minutes and then look at their friend who maybe wasn't so interested and then go yeah yeah we'll follow you on Instagram <laughs> and you're like <laughs> you're not going to follow us on Instagram but I appreciate the energy anyway um so yeah I found that really difficult um and I guess also kind of I hadn't done it before myself so kind of I had a really really great few people supporting me in the community I'm, I'm not doing this festival alone obviously I've got an amazing committee behind me and there were a few people on that committee that were so supportive and kind of kept me going because obviously there were times when I was like am I go am, am I doing the right thing am I um, is this actually going to work? Um, will we sell any tickets? <laughs> and yeah, I think for me, I had a really great few people just kind of pushing me along. Um, but that was a challenge as well, kind of keeping that energy up. Um, yeah. Because of course, there's going to be dips and there's going to be peaks and troughs. Um, I remember when we started selling our tickets, um, uh, we, we did a crowdfunder. I don't know. That was kind of one of our ways of gauging whether the festival would be able to go ahead because um yeah you need money to run a festival and we didn't have a pot of money to put in we kind of we ha we relied on ticket sales so we went about the crowdfunder as a way of kind of gauging how much interest we'd have um and I remember that was being quite a stressful experience because <laughs> it took a while to kind of speed up um but it did speed up but it was a two month <laughs> of kind of a little bit of anxiety um as to whether we'd whether we'd sell enough tickets basically to run um and yeah, yeah. that was a challenge I think has, have I answered your question I can't tell if I've just gone <laughs> no that's perfect yeah yeah no it's all about uncovering like networks of people there's there's a lot of hidden ones that you don't see on the surface it's all about knowing the odd person that might be able to tap in and connecting those people so there is a lot a lot going on um and I say it, look, with the crowdfunder it can always be it's like retaining uh their interest so some people might pay for tickets but then not turn up and you yeah it's all about trusting trusting your community and if they're going to pull together even at the end so yeah no I can imagine it's very stressful but I'll oh, work down the end. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Rosie, um, have you faced any other challenges, especially when you started out? Uh, it was hard getting your name out there, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I started in February 2020 and uh, like I'd been working on building the bakery, it's like converting a horse box a bit and stuff. And and then there was a beer festival on at the pub and some of the guys had been taking samples around my neighbours and stuff. And then uh, one of the guys was like, why don't you make bread every day for the beer festival? So I just took it around to the pub each day and they were just like, yeah, just like do some samples and stuff and then have a few loaves and sell them. And then it turned into like every Friday selling it in the pub. And then I had another job at that point too. Um, and so that's kind of how it spread like that. And I was quite shy to kind of just actually open the door of the horse box. And then obviously lockdown happened, so it had to evolve and it turned into orders and deliveries. And it was interesting, the different people, uh, starting in a pub, the pub is, it is a hub of a community, like massively. And that's how I know a lot of folk is because of being in there for years. And just there's certain folk come at different times of day and it's just, I don't know, you become more of a familiar face because you kind of see you about, I guess. And so it wasn't so, I feel it would have felt, really really shy just to turn up here with the yellow horse box and be like hey here I am here's my bread this is what I'm doing you know like some folk could do that but yeah so um yeah it was quite a gradual process I think that kind of worked okay as well if you're talking about, about kind of rural communities I think it's like okay cool like and to put a sign up and they can understand what's going on a bit more and then like 
come and ask some questions and they could try it at the pub and it's kind of just a gradual process of just understanding what you're up to and then there's different community if I'm talking about kind of like the bikers kind of community and so like within cycling I had some customers and they must have told their mates and it's by word of uh, mouth that it spread like that and then kind of yeah it just kind of evolved there but the thing about other things you talked there about meeting other young folk and stuff too like I was really really lonely during the first lockdown like I started my business and I was living alone and I didn't really see it anybody except I dropped bread off and I used to hang it in yellow bags outside folks houses and yeah I wondered one day if I just went and sat in a chair in the driveway maybe like you'd see folk passing by like you'd get a bit of a chat it happened once or twice I didn't sit in the chair in the driveway but <laughs> it turned into that basically because it was like a big yellow horse box sat in the driveway and I just standing in there waving at folk so yeah and then I guess people were kind of about and curious and then they would come and kind of hang about and just I'd spend a lot of time talking and so they would just stick around and chat and then meet other folk and yeah so we've met more folk and then more folk have moved to the area as well um like kind of younger people and um, with kind of jobs in ecology and stuff too so um but I've been amazed at how many have come and literally been like I got a text off someone the other day it's just like hey I'm, I'm like looking for friends like it's like a normal response like kind of thing now and I think it's quite interesting that people feel confident to say that and just be like this is what I'm needing if you want to hang out kind of I don't know it, it's yeah. nice straight to the point and then it's like yeah you know so there's the, you're talking about communities like that it's because then you become friends with folk because you happen to be in the same place as well so yeah I think it's like I live in a rural community too and it's all about trust and familiarity mm -hmm. and making a safe space for people to feel safe and come to like approach you and yeah like become familiar with what you do and then they pass it on and they pass it on so especially in rural communities words of mouth is is amazing social media is great but word of mouth in like villages is just it is amazing yeah so i've noticed around here is more so facebook there's like a village page and there's like that's used a lot more than in, instagram is like this wider kind of community of I was, whereas Facebook is seems to be more what's happening right here. Yeah. Also, people want to know how long you're sticking about for because this area there's a lot of people coming for seasons and stuff. So they kind of it was like oh so this is a lockdown project. I was like no I was planning it before that just happened like and it's you know but there's this kind of as to I guess how how invested do you get in that as in are you about to disappear off or kind of I don't know there seems to be this kind of also kind of weariness around I think but um. Yeah, but they, I heard I saw a good quote thing there already, which is like the grass is always greener, or but the greenest grass, the grass is greenest where you water it. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Over to you, Ellie, if you. Yeah, so actually, we've been joined. Josh has managed to overcome the power cut issues and is available. So we're going to spotlight Josh for a minute and just backtrack and introduce our third panelist. Um, and if, yeah, is that all right, Rose? If you can spotlight Josh, he's in the, he's across the top. And yeah, Josh, welcome. And it would be so nice to hear a bit about your story, <laughs> who you are, where you are, and what you get up to, and maybe just paint a bit of a picture about about your amazing initiative that you're part of hi everyone um i'm um, uh, i'm i'm josh um uh, um uh, i am uh, i'm sort of part of the team that sets up um ragtag arts um here in or well, just outside kendall um me and my sister set up together um about six years ago now um uh, and um uh, we've been running a project for six years and then we moved into our new venue um uh, which is a uh, um, it's called a scrap store. It's a, um, a centre that um, reclaims and recycles materials and turns it into creative resources um, across the community. So we're a sort of resource centre for schools, for community groups, for artists, um, and, um, and really thinking about creative ways of reusing, repurposing scrap. Um, and then the centre is also a bit of a sort of hub for local artists. Um, we've got nine studio spaces um, uh, that we rent out to local artists and have a few kind of like more like hot desk um, uh, opportunities as well around ceramics and things like that. Um, 
Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it's an exciting project to be part of. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting just hearing um, uh, some of your other stories about, you know, it's, you set something up in, in sort of rural environments and, um, uh, and you know, when we sort of first started, um, uh, you just don't quite know really when, when you start something out, kind of how it's going to go and um, uh, um, how it's going to be received by people. Um, uh, and um, there definitely was this kind of like quite a long transition period. Um, I mean, for us, it was probably, you know, a good sort of three years really of, of really feeling like, oh, are we here to stay? Uh, is this a, like, you know, can we sustain this? Um, uh, and it's only really been in the last, you know, year, two years where we've actually felt like, oh, actually, no, we are, we are here now. Like, you know, we can, we can afford to pay ourselves every month, um, which we've not been able to do for quite a long time. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, um, uh, so that that's um, uh, that's a bit about us. Um, I'm also one of the um, uh, the team that put on um, Kendall Torchlight as well. Um, uh, so a, a kind of community festival in Kendall. Um, uh, and um, uh, I've completely lost track of what questions you had for us. <laughs> oh, don't worry at all. Don't worry at all. But no, it's really interesting. And so your day to day, what does that look like in terms of um, how does the scrap store work and yeah um, what do you get up to so um so there's a there's a little team of us now um so um it's it's myself and my sister emily um so we we set the thing up together um emily um kind of manages the space a lot of the time and um we've got a, a volunteering program um a real mix of volunteers from um um adults um and retired people, vulnerable adults, um, um, young people, adults with learning difficulties, a real, a real mix of um, really lovely, amazing people. Um, mm -hmm. And they kind of are the, the heart of the project, really. And they um, um, kind of work with us throughout the week um, from doing things like kind of making up our scrap kits, um, which are sort of like craft packs that we make for kids um, out of reclaimed materials, helping sort and manage the scrap store. Um, helping kind of run workshops and things like that um and um, uh, um i sort of tend to do more of our event um uh, stuff so we we started out as an event project you know working in schools running um children's workshops and creative activities um and doing kind of festival activities um uh, and sort of over the years we've developed a a number of um um productions I guess that we take to events um, um, all based around scrap and recycling so we have a, a, um, a, a, a make your own crazy golf course that we take to events um, a project called cardboard castle which is just a giant castle made out of cardboard that kids paint and play in and um, and things like that um, and then I sort of um, over the last five years I've been working with Torchlight um, and helping um, as one of the artists on the team, but also producing um, the festival um, with the, 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 there's a team of volunteers that work on that festival as well. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it's a, there's a lot, a lot going on. Um, uh, yeah, really varied. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it is one of those. You never quite know what the day is going to hold. <laughs> what your job title is. <laughs> um, I, my last question for you, Josh, before I give you a little break for a minute, was just um, why do you care about what you do? Like, what is it that really has got you and motivates you and drives you um so um well i, I think and I, I think this is probably something that's similar it could be similar for a lot of people who work in the arts is that sometimes you feel like you can't really do anything else um I, i've definitely i've never i mean i've had lots of other jobs um a lot of them working with people um, working as a carer um uh, working um with um uh, young people doing youth work and things um and um, uh, um uh, what am i saying i've always felt like actually kind of doing creative work doing work in the community is is what i'm good at it's what is it's kind of almost sometimes you kind of feel like it's the only thing you're good at <laughs> like and um, uh, um uh, and i that you know that drives me um uh, i i love um uh, working with people i love creating new things um uh, um uh, when when you work on a festival and you sort of see it from 
it's very kind of beginning ideas and I'm just starting to write you know stuff for next year's um, Torchlight Festival and those sort of like you know real kind of tiny little gems of ideas that then you sort of see grow and turn into something and then people get involved in it and it goes in all different directions that you didn't kind of imagine that it could do and, and I think that is is really special and um, that um, I think for us we know we grew up um, Emmy and I grew up in Wiltshire um, uh, and there was a scrap store in Wiltshire and um, uh, um, uh, and uh, we used it so much for you know for school projects for um, uh, and as we sort of grew up um, uh, you know starting to work um, in the arts and um, uh, you know helping with kind of youth camps and things like that um, we kind of used those materials and and then um, uh, when we when we set up the project in Kendall we we really wanted we sort of had a model in a sense that we want we wanted to see happen here and um, uh, um, uh, you know I think that was I think something if you can see what it is I think that's really helpful sometimes mm. um, uh, so if that answers your question yeah um, perfect thank you so much um I am just going to throw another question out there um to everybody out of the well the other panelists Jess and Rosie as well um I wondered what would you guys say is like the best technique that you've used to kind of connect with your community? So a creative technique that you use to connect with your, your community in your field. Uh, maybe Jess, over to you. Hopefully that makes sense. It does make sense. I was hoping you wouldn't pick me first because I was having a think. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, I think it's a very good question. Um, I think I've tried lots of different ways of reaching out to the community. Um, I think there's a few that have worked really well. Uh, one was we've run a few kind of competition based um, marketing campaigns where to try and find new musicians and artists, we've set a competition for people to submit their ideas and their like, for example, we ran a short film competition and we had so many people submit amazing short films. And that was a really cool way to kind of grow and connect with our community, um, kind of involving people. And then they were showcased at our festival, uh, which was really cool um, on the big, the big screen. Um, so that was a really lovely way of doing it. And something I'm really looking forward to do again, and I think I'll hopefully do for as long as the festival runs um it's a great way to kind of find those hidden gems that hear about you but you don't know about um and i guess the other way that i've found really great is kind of again i guess word of mouth and finding people who are doing a similar thing to you um because you can learn so much from other people uh, i had really I was very very lucky someone reached out to me well the founder of a festival down south called Brainchild um, and she gave me a like two hour mentoring call I guess um, and that was amazing because she was six six years ahead of me um, mm. and shared so much insights that I just did not have and I wouldn't have until I'd done it for six years and yeah, I think that's another amazing way of reaching out to the community because she could then put me in contact with people. I guess she spoke about it. She had a bigger community of people already that were interested in the same kind of things of me and advertised it to that community. And one day, I, I know it's, all, it's not about Instagram followers. That's not, I, I think that's just a very objective way of measuring it. But like, I think our followers went up from, it just went up so much. <laughs> after they'd advertised about us. I think that was an amazing mm -hmm. way to kind of reach that community. And I hope um, I can be the, I, can, I hope I can play a similar role with someone else in the future. Uh, I'd love that. I think that'd be amazing. Mm. It's amazing. I was having an exact uh, conversation with a friend a couple of nights ago about how when people have like passion projects, they're so desperate to share. So like reaching out to people for like as a mentor, even though it can feel really like, oh, why would they want to give me their time? So often people are so willing to, to share and you maybe don't expect it. So it's sometimes being a bit brave, isn't it? Just to ask. 
Yeah, and it's kind of like, I was, it's interesting. Josh, um, someone from Ragtags contacted us asking if they could make an art installation for the festival. And that was an amazing way of kind of, mm. well, I guess they did the hard work of contacting us, but that was amazing because I kind of discovered Ragtags and I thought it was, an, I think it's an awesome initiative. Um, and yeah, I guess it is, uh, there's so many people who are passionate about similar things. And mm. sometimes you just kind of have to, put yourself out there and have a bit of luck as well. And yeah, hopefully stumble across some lovely like-minded people. That's great. Thank you, Jess. Um, Rosie, what about you? What would you say is like a creative technique that you've used to connect with your community? Um, well, the bread in the pub, that was like a way of getting that it out there first, but then actually I painted a sign. So the, bo- the oven came in a wooden box and I painted it in a, stuck it out of the roadside and said sourdough bread and then folk knew what was going on basically but I think that yeah you need to have like some kind of presence online but the reality is it's the people that's passing by like for what I'm doing it's the folk that's going to pass by and so yeah just literally putting a sign up saying yeah this is what they just said sourdough bread more info email this and then I'd send out I had that kind of draft email I sent out to folk um and then more recently, it's been other things, other media things. I don't know, I've been on the radio or um, your article in the newspaper, actually, the, um, the one that was in the PNJ. I've, there's a, a regular customer I have now. The other week, he was like, that's how he found out was through the newspaper. And there was the same, <laughs> the local newspaper here as well. Um, yeah, those kind of traditional ways, I guess. And then... I think it's just a slightly attention-seeking, interesting-looking thing. Anyway, do you know, like the it, the fact that it's bright yellow and a bit odd, people I think just come over and see what's going on too. So I think just kind of standing out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I interviewed Rosie a year ago and then wrote a little. Uh, well, yeah, wrote an article on her. Um, re- yeah, on reviving foods and um, yeah, I loved actually hearing Rosie. You just say that the power of a sign like it was just a bright yellow painted sign and you can spend all this time like signing up for every social media platform but really ultimately if you're connecting with people on the ground like just make it really obvious and it's sometimes we could overcomplicate things couldn't we and overlook that the power of that so yeah and you're paying for all these websites and whatever and being on google and someone else put me on google and this there's all these different things it's like well are these people I don't know it's like how many people on Instagram are actually going to come and buy your product mm. okay it's nice to have some kind of online like yeah I think it, it uh, which uh, it makes you look good if you've got an online presence maybe you know uh, maybe mm. you're maybe legit in some kind of way but I think the reality of just having something right tangibly there is quite good too yeah okay thanks and what about you Josh um, it's always a difficult, to be honest, I think one thing is, is persistence. Um, I think it's really easy to, um, to get disheartened. Um, you try these new things, because sometimes you try things and they don't work. I mean, we've had that so much. We, we've tried things and they've just not, they've not taken off. Um, and, um, but then they, but they, they then, it's led to something else or, uh, and I think, I think my advice to anyone sort of starting out or, or trying to sort of build a following and trying to sort of connect with people is, is not to get disheartened when it doesn't happen immediately. Um, and, um, and to, um, I think if you, you know, trust in what you're doing, like if you've got a good product and if you, or if you, you, you know what you're doing, um, uh, um, you can, if you believe what you're doing, then, then actually that, that drive, um, uh, will keep you going and will um you know people your story is actually really i think sometimes one of the most powerful things you have and and the, and then telling the kind of like how things um how you got to where you got to and and your passion about what you're working on and where you want to get to and things um it really kind of captures people's imaginations and um, i think that's definitely been our story is um um you know things start small sometimes and um, um uh, and and even and then even when we try new things like you know setting up um 
children's um like we've got a, like a regular um children's club that meets after school um and um and there've been there've been some um what's the word so, some um some terms where it's been really really quiet um and it would be easy to kind of go oh okay it, that that hasn't worked um, but then actually the next term it, it built and it grew and um and so i think sometimes it's just you know if it if it doesn't work you know don't just give up straight away um give it, give it some time to bed in sorry i keep getting attacked by various critters <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely addition <laughs> that's great thanks josh <laughs> so yeah just a uh, just a final question to to everyone uh, before we go on to audience uh, questions. So how has your involvement with the community impacted your own sense of belonging? So I know some of you have moved, especially Jess, you've moved from the air up to a new area. Um, so yeah, how, how has it impacted your sense of belonging either in the area or in, in your own little communities? Uh, we'll start with Jess, yeah. I think there's, uh, like Rosie was saying earlier, um, there's different communities, I guess, and my sense of belonging within them. So I guess the the local community, um, yeah, coming from a place where I didn't, I didn't know anyone based here. And I feel like, I do feel there's a sense of attachment to where I now live. And I know like-minded people within the local area, which is really cool. And, um, I do feel a much more of a sense of a belonging here where if I want to go and do something fun with someone I can and that kind of sense of yeah of a family I guess um which I've only started to really feel over the last few months it's taken me about a year to kind of plant some roots um and then I guess with the community in the sense of people sharing your values or respecting your values I guess that's a kind of answers its own question because yeah if you have people that respect you and value you and your ideas then of course that makes you feel a sense of belonging and I think I've felt very kind of lucky to have a group of people around me that are really passionate about the same things as me and has made me feel like I have a purpose um so I think it's been a big part of me having a sense of belonging and I think during the kind of move to a new place um this passion project has been a really big part of that and a really positive part of that amazing thank you um so Rosie how how has it impacted your sense of belonging because I know starting off in the pubs probably built it up quite well you've got familiar with people yeah how's yeah it it's it seems like what Jess is saying, it just like settled and just more settled into both, like, or all of these kind of ones is like, I don't know, you've got a kind of place and it's a role. And so it's like known my role. And there was one week early on in lockdown, which I didn't bake. And it, I felt terrible, like, just like that either, like, yeah, it was just like, no, I have to just keep going, get back on, just keep sticking with it. Like, um, it was actually probably really good to stop that day and actually realise, because there was other points that got tougher, but it was just like, now you just have to keep going, like what Josh was saying there too, and just persisting. And often whenever anything changes here, it takes kind of, you know, like four weeks or more for it to kind of actually catch on. Like if you're open different days or, you know, it's just, it, it takes a bit of time for, yeah, I don't know, changing behaviours. But yeah, no, just having a sense of a role and, uh yeah it just kind of being clear i guess what i'm doing for i don't know like um instead of just this idea oh yeah i'm going to do this i'm i'm doing it and so that's a good thing too yeah, yeah definitely and um, suppose like with other people like how you started they recommended you going into the pub and it started from there that creates a sense of belonging because they want you there <laughs> Yeah, and so they've massively, massively helped. And that's why, like, to do with being able to sell the bread in the pub to begin with and him just being, like, so welcoming for me to be able to do that there. And then uh, now with moving to the hall, they want me to be there because they're trying to 
there's no pop-up post office so there's no post office there for two hours on a friday and then there's all these other things kind of coming on from that so it is becoming a community hub but i've got this reliable customer base which is built up over the last couple of years that you know it's that that's then people come into the hub whether they then want to use the post office or you know it's like so yeah it's it's really great the support the support of the folk that's buying the bread and the support of the community and when there's been other challenges in the last couple of months too i've got like the whole committee they've kind of they've shown that they've got my back as well and stuff too so um yeah it's amazing really good. yeah it's really good yeah and i get called out as today i was in a charity shop in Aviemore, and it just like yeah i don't know they just people know it's me it's bread that's it it's just <laughs> that's what you want yeah perfect <laughs> And then uh, finally, Josh, so how's setting up Ragtag um, uh, impacted your sense of belonging, especially being like a hub in the area? Um, massively, really massively. I mean, because um, I moved to Kendall, I moved to Kendall to set up Ragtag. Um, I'd been sort of away kind of traveling for about two years. And so um, before I moved um, up to Kendall, so I, I felt very transient and kind of in between things and um, I was living um, in a van at the time and um, so I was sort of a bit all over the place really didn't really know where home was in a sense and um, and so actually moving to Kendall and moving to Kendall with a purpose and um, something that we felt like I felt like I could bring um, was um, was really powerful and I think um, it's been a massive part of my my social kind of my friends and um you know i've met some really amazing people through doing what i do and, and i think um i think one of the biggest lessons i've had to learn is like um is is not feeling i mean i think it's funny you kind of you chat to so many other people who are sort of set up their own businesses or work trying to work as an artist Thing. oh dear is that all of our internet <laughs> i think it might just be josh's is, is that just josh's oh what a shame oh. <laughs> right i'm gonna sp i maybe speed on and come back to josh when he rejoins um Sorry, guys, we've re I've realised we've only got three minutes to seven and I really don't want to run over too much. So um, I really apologise. I think we only have time for one question from the audience. And we've got one in the chat from Tracer. Um, and yeah. she says, thanks and really enjoying the yeah. Ideas Cafe and your stories. Um, and what advice it. would... Oh, sorry, George. <laughs> what advice would you give both... Um, would, you, would you give to a young person thinking of setting up a business enterprise in a rural area? So like a top tip or something would be brilliant to share. Um, Josh, how are you doing? Sorry, did you hear that? No, we'll come back to Josh in a minute, but um, maybe go to Jess first, please. So a top tip for somebody else taking the leap and wanting to set up their own thing. I think I have a few tips. <laughs> My top tip probably would be go for it and um, back yourself. And if you love, if you've got a passion for something, most likely there'll be other people that share that passion. Um, I guess that's my top tip. Um, the, there's loads of things I could say, but I don't, I think we haven't got much time. Um, also find people that can help you. It's not something, I don't think, I think often doing things alone are really difficult. And that doesn't have to be someone who's running the same project as you, but someone to support you um, because it's, it's, it is challenging. Um, so yeah, I'd say people are your, people will help you <laughs> throughout that whole project and um, yeah, go for it. Thank you, Jess. So important. Thank you. Um, Rosie, what about you? Uh, work, I'd say work out what you really care about and what you can do to make that happen. And the same, like, yeah, find support with other people. I went to the Business Gateway originally and then they sent me to the Impact Hub in Inverness. And so it's like, just, yeah, go and speak to somebody um, that can then get you involved with other networks and support mm. to get it to happen but yeah just work out what you care about a lot mm. 
Thank you. Josh, can you hear us? You there? No, I think we we might have lost Josh. Well, well, he did well to come back after that. Um, (laughs) Wow, thanks so much, guys. Um, Thank you for everyone that has joined us. Um, We'll really try and stick to time, so we're not going to ask those other questions, but please, um, if you kind of recognise each other, and please reach out to each other. Um, Oh, I was going to ask, actually, Rosie and um, Jess, do you want to just drop in the chat, maybe, where's best for people to get hold of you? Um, and we are actually from uh, GPLD and OIP. We're doing, we're launching a survey today um, on how people connect with their communities in rural areas. Um, so I'm just going to drop that into the chat, and we're going to be sending that out in our newsletters and putting it on our website. So um, it would be brilliant if you can kind of share that within your networks to hear from as many young rural people. Um, and we'll be kind of gathering that research and hoping hoping that the results can. Um, well, can go on to inform how organisations behave and um, and how yeah how we connect with one another in rural areas. So I'll put that there in the chat. Um, and yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jess. Um, thanks, Rosie. Um, Josh, sorry you m- missed us just there, but we just w- wondered if you would put your um, website link into the chat so people can get hold of you. I'll do it now. <laughs> And if you had it up your sleeve, the last question was, what would be your top tip for another young person like looking to launch their business or enterprise? What would your top tip be to share? Um, just go for it. Just, just <laughs> go for it. Um, find people that will support you. Find, find people to, to kind of be able to have coffee with or have a beer with or, you know, whatever you need to do to just keep motivating yourself um, uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and do it. Um, uh, like you won't look back and it, it's, it's really worth just, just, just have a go. What's the worst that can happen? That's my thought. I love it. And it's so brilliant, Josh, because you missed on what other people said, but actually it's so similar what the three of you have raised. It's like those two points of like just get just putting yourself out there and going for it. But finding your tribe, this comes up again and again, actually, with how we when we speak to people of just like find your supporters and don't be afraid to reach out and connect with people that care about the same things. Because yeah. it just so important. Don't know what will open up, do you? Thank you. Uh, Beth, did you want to add anything before we say goodbye to everybody? Um, no, I just want to say thank you for, uh, for everyone for joining and Josh for jumping back in. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've, uh, GPLD have a, a new project coming up that works a lot with um, young voices and creative careers, but a lot will be announced in January. So yeah, we'll just keep an eye out. I'm sure we'll get to collaborate a lot uh, with mm. lots of you um, and see a lot more uh, young initiatives coming in. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah, again, with Rural Youth Project, please reach out. Um, we're here to support you. And and again, we want to be the connect, you know, that's our role is to connect the dots and put you in touch with people. So if you know of other, other young people that are looking to network, then please do feel that you can reach out to both organisations. And we actually have been developing a community toolkit over the last year at the Rural Youth Project. So you can find that on our website. So, um, and that's free to download. And so there's some, lots of tips and tricks in there. So again, it could be a useful resource to share with other people that you think might be looking to launch something in their community. Um, but we've managed to almost <laughs> stick to time. <laughs> Only three minutes over. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much to our three amazing speakers. Um, really appreciate you sharing your stories. Um, it's so meaningful storytelling and sharing. So um, it, you don't know who it might touch and what change it might spark. So thank you so much. And um, we'll say goodbye. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. See you all.